Hi. How are you? How many of you saw the first Star Wars in the theater when you were kids? Yes. We weren't a kid. Oh, I remember I saw it in St. Albans. It was awesome. My uncle came in from Washington, took me and my cousin, and we got to see the very first one uh, in the theaters. So that was so cool. So uh, who do you think came up with this marathon thing? 8 o'clock. We're going to start Saturday morning the 12th. Should take us to about 10 p.m. I'm bringing my recliner, and I'll be here in my sweatpants and my t-shirts. And so, just so you know, this is going to be a relaxing day. We got breakfast planned, we got lunch planned, we got dinner planned. Um, so this is going to be cool. You don't want to miss it. This makes a great movie theater, and this is where we'll be. So my plug for that. We'll see you then, Lord willing. Um, I'm glad you came today. I know we got a lot of guests and visitors for a very special service. We're in the middle of, actually, towards the end of our service about Moses. And as you saw on the sign, the, the series is just when you thought it was over. And so kind of big picture, we've been walking with the Israelites and Moses and learning that if we're still breathing, God's not done with us. I mean, a lot of stuff happened during that period of time. We're going to get back and finish it next week and transfer into our Christmas series. And then we'll get back to Joshua starting the first Sunday in January. So you know where we're going, where we've been. Uh, but today is a very special day. Today we have a privilege of doing baby dedications. And we've got several families. It's been a good year in a lot of ways, but our biological growth has been incredible. And today we have a total of nine babies being dedicated to nine little ones. So I'm going to ask the families to go ahead and bring your children up and come up here. Join me up here. And as you're coming, um, I'll explain a little bit to the congregation about what we're doing. All right, so let me, I see some people stirring and moving. <clears throat> And you stole my thing. All right, I'm going to steal it back. Yes, people. Okay. Just make some spots here. Baby dedication is... Um, and, and family, you can come down front and take pictures if you want. You're welcome to. You won't hurt our feelings. Um, baby dedication is... It's not a command, so you know not everybody submits to it. Um, and it's important to understand it, it's more of a custom and, and a tradition of the church. And what it is, I've got to be careful about explaining this, is, is the parents dedicating themselves to raising these gifts of God in a godly way. Okay? It doesn't save the children. We be very, very careful about that. Salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And every individual has to come to that position in their life where they understand who they are, where they are in reference to God, and how they restore this relationship to Christ. So again, I'm very cautious about this. These children are not saved, and this ceremony is actually more about the parents. Okay, and you're going to hear about that here shortly. So just so you understand, again, it's a tradition. It's, it's a, maybe a ritual in some places, but I think it's very, very important. As you're going to hear, this is where my passion is in ministry. It's with the family. That is it's my highest priority, and so I'm so excited that these couples come bringing their children and that you've come with them today. So let me walk through this. Uh, I've got them in alphabetical order. You almost did it too. All right, almost stood in alphabetical order. All right, we got Chad and Tess Atkins, and we have Cohen, who was born July 14th, uh, wow, 2015, and they also bring in Daxton as well, who's taking a nap. <laughs> All right, we have Aaron and Tara Amick with Brenna Rowan, born February 23rd of this year. And, wave and say hi, Brenna. We have Ben and Erica Burdett. Everybody wave. And we have Asher Allen Burdett, born August 27th of 2015. We've got some of these people you might recognize. Andrew and Chelsea Gordon with Zoe Anastasia Gordon, born the 16th of August. Wave, Zoe. Wave, Zoe. There we go. All right, John and Tanya Paisley with Olivia Kathleen Paisley. Hi, born April 1st of this year. Okay, and then we have Mark and Emily Toole. Hi, Carly. Hi, Carly. Mark and Emily Toole with Carly Ann Toole, born June the 6th of this year. All right, what an awesome picture of life. Um, it's, it's really awesome. Our, our greatest life is eternal life through Jesus Christ, but then he gives us children to see the hope of the next day. So we're so grateful for this. Um, the parents are coming this morning, and they're going to make vows regarding how they wish to raise their children. And that's what this is all about. It's kind of like a wedding ceremony. 
Um, this is you being witnesses and God being a witness that they are get dedicating themselves to raising these children in a godly way. And I'm going to give them some vows. They're going to respond. And we're going to expect you as a church to come around them, uh, to be teachers and nursery workers and parking lot workers and everything else that's necessary so these children get the best opportunity to know Jesus Christ. And that's what it's all about, okay? So they're going to say, we do, when I say their vows. And we're going to walk through this, okay? Parents, are you ready? Okay. Parents, do you understand that these children are gifts from God? And do you agree that they are a special reward from our Heavenly Father? Awesome. Parents, do you understand that they need correction? And if so, do you vow today to lovingly correct and instruct your children according to God's Word? Okay. Parents, do you understand that these children need direction? Do you vow today to be living examples to them and to ensure that they receive training and instruction in the ways of the Lord? All right, last one. Parents, do you understand that your children have an ultimate purpose in this life? Do you vow today to invest in their lives so that they may use their God-given passions and abilities to be representatives of Jesus Christ in their particular walk of life? Let's pray. God, thank you so much for the picture in front of us today, the picture of new life through these children. You have blessed these families tremendously. These children are gifts. They're tremendous rewards and I am so thankful to hear husbands and wives committing to being the parents that you've asked them to be. We're going to talk that through today, Father. It's going to be a great opportunity for them, but also for the family members and other members of this church who've come today to celebrate. So, Father, I ask that you will bless the vows that they've made. Uh, bless the ears of those who've heard them and encourage us to uh, renew ours and, and our own families and also to support and encourage theirs uh, as well. So, Father, we thank you for this special blessing. Uh, now, Lord, please place your hand of mercy, grace, and understanding on these parents. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, give them a hand, please, as they come down. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> All right. Well, this is a very special message. Don't get in a hurry. Don't get in a hurry. It's a very special message today, and it is very pointed. All right, I am preaching to these eight or seven or eight couples here. You're the audience to hear this. It's kind of like a wedding again. I'm going to talk to them about being the parents that God wants them to be. And what you're going to find out is that God brought you here for a purpose. You know, if you have kids or if you're going to have kids in the future, if you have nieces, nephews, grandchildren, whatever it is, you all have an investment in the future. And what we learn today will help each one of us in this room better invest ourselves in the future. So, um, there's a lot of questions that come with parenting. We talked about them this morning. Uh, today, should you use a midwife or a hospital physician? There's questions that these couples themselves have had to decide. Um, do you breastfeed or do you use formula? Okay, that's, that's a question they have to answer. Do you vaccinate? Boy, that's a big one today. Should you vaccinate? What vaccination should you do? Uh, do you use disposable diapers or cloth diapers? Ick! I can't believe that's a question. <laughs> but I guess it has financial issues to it. We just had the baby diaper caddy thing that you put them in and you hoped it never opened or blew up. And if you had one of them diaper caddies blow up, ooh, they're bad, really bad. Um, but should you use diapers or disposal, disposables or cloth? Um, should mom stay at home? This is a big one. Should mom continue to pursue her career, or should she stay at home and you know, be the career mother? That's a big question today, because our economy has changed. Um, when, are they, when they're old enough for school, should they go to public school? Should they go to private school? Should they go to Christian school? Should they be homeschooled? Okay, that's a big question you've got to answer. How about when they get a little older and they start talking about sports? How old do they have to be to compete in sports? Which sports will you let them compete in? You know? When will you let them start? So there's a lot of questions that come to a parent's mind when you've been blessed with a child. But today I want to talk about the greatest question you can possibly ask as a parent. And here it is, it's right up front. What does God want from parents? As a parent, you want to know, what does God want from me? All these other things, there really are no right or wrong answers to the things I just gave you. A lot of them are preferences, a lot of them are specific to your family needs and your child's needs. 
So those things don't have right and wrong answers. This does. Okay? Finding out what God wants from you as a parent is very clear. I'm going to have a very short Bible reading. It's in Malachi chapter 2. I read from the NLT, which is in the Bible underneath your seat. So if you want to stand with me, you can just listen if you'd like. It's a short verse. If you can't stand, it's okay. Nobody will be offended. Malachi chapter 2, verse 15. It's the last book in the Old Testament, if you're not familiar with that part. One of the minor prophets, we call them. Okay? Malachi chapter, 15, or chapter 2, verse 15. Just a short passage to set us up today. The Lord is speaking to men. Okay? So men in the room. The Lord is speaking to men. We're going to talk a lot about you today. He's speaking to the men of His people. Didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? In body and spirit, you are His. And what does He want? The flag should come up right here. What does He want? Godly children from your union. So... Guard your heart. Remain loyal to the wife of your youth. One verse, and that's enough. God, thank you for what you've said already. Thank you for the illustration of parenting that we have before us today. Thank you for what we're going to talk about, the fact that family is the greatest picture of our heavenly reward. And so we're looking forward to that. I ask that you bless everyone who is here today, the believers who came. Bless us all with the reminder of what you expect from us. Uh, those who don't know you, those who made it in here, are still trying to figure out Christianity, or still trying to figure out religion, whatever it is. Uh, Father, you've trusted them in our presence today. Uh, may they let their guard down for long enough to hear uh, what you have to say about this situation, this, this issue of raising children. And most importantly, may they understand that this is a model of the way that you love us. And maybe this will be the day that they surrender their lives to Jesus Christ for salvation and then become the husband, the father the parent, the child that uh, you want them to be. So, Father, thank you for what you're about to do. Remove me from it. Speak through it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, be, please be seated. Our lesson today, just to give you the historical background, because you must study the Scripture in context. You can't just pull one out. Um, we're, we've been with Moses about 1400 B.C. Now we're going to fast forward through Moses, through Joshua, into the Promised Land, through the book of Judges, uh, through the kings, the chronicles, Samuel. You've got... Saul, David, Solomon, the big three kings of the unified nation of Israel. Then, about 900 B.C., they come apart. The nation divides. You've got the northern tribes of Israel, the southern tribes of Judah, about 900 B.C. The northern tribes never have good leadership. They continue to fall away from God. They continue to sin with God. They're wicked people. And so God allows terrorists to come in and take them away. The Assyrians were the terrorists of their day. They were from Nineveh. Okay? And they came in and they beheaded people and stacked their heads at the gates of the city to scare people off. They filleted people alive. These are God's people, God's Israelites. He filleted them alive, they did, and they put them over a wicker fence around their capital city of Nineveh. He let the terrorists come in and take the northern tribes because they refused to follow God. They're still gone, by the way, if you didn't know. They haven't regrouped yet. They will at one point. But those are the lost tribes of Israel. And that's what happened to them in 722 B.C. The, the southern tribes of Judah, they had some good leadership. They experienced some revival. They would fall away from God and come back to God and clean out the altars and clean out the, the government. And they would get things right for a while and they'd fall away again. Eventually they sinned to the point that God had to judge them. And this time it was 586 and he brought the Babylonians in. And, and they had kind of a peaceful overtaking where they took Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, all those guys that you've heard about before, and they took them to Babylon. But there always was a righteous remnant in the south. And so God preserved them and let them come back. Ezra, Nehemiah, you know, Zerubbabel, all these guys brought it back and they built the city again. And this time they say, this will not happen to us again. We will not fall away from God. We're going to walk the straight and narrow they became ultra, ultra conservative. Our God is one God. We're never going to look to the right or look to the left. This is how it goes. And that drove them into a legalistic type of religion instead of a relationship with God. And they really got away from God. They made all these laws and they said, you have to do this and you have to do that. And they mix, missed the big picture of who God wanted them to be. And the passage you hear today comes as marriages are falling apart. It comes as families are falling apart. It comes in a very dark period of time for the Israelites when God is very angry 
and upset with the people. And in this passage, he tells them, Listen, guys, I gave you to each other, husband and wife, so that you could do this. You could have godly children from your union. What's the question you need to ask as parents? What does God expect of me as a parent? The answer is simple. It's to have godly children from your union. Okay, we're finished. We'll pray, sing a song, and go home. You're done early today. There's a couple of you like that. I know. You've already had your kids. They're out of the house. they got their own kids. I'm going home. Yay, we got to see the babies dedicated. That wouldn't be cool for most of you, especially for the families who brought their babies this morning. It's not fair to tell you what God wants without telling you how to do it. And that's the, the big deal of a sermon. A sermon should reveal God's truth on a certain topic, but it should also explain what God expects of us and how to do it. And so that's what we're going to spend the time on, okay? You know what God wants. From marriage between a man and a woman, God wants godly children for the next generation. That's the answer. Now let's talk about how that happens, okay? I'm going to turn in my Bible. You don't have to. You can just listen if you want. Uh, if, if you've ever sat in my marriage counseling or pre-marriage counseling, you know exactly what I'm going to talk about. There's a lot in the scripture about family, husband and wife, raising children, um, and the Apostle Paul wrote a lot about it. And so I'm going to take one of the passages that's really compressed. It's chapter 5 of Ephesians, verse 33, through chapter 6, verse 4. All right? And this is the how of the what. Okay? This is the how. How do we have children that are godly? Listen close. So again I say, which means he's just reiterating this longer passage he's discussed on the topic. Each man must love his wife as he loves himself. And the wife must respect her husband. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you, and you will have a long life on this earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Now, I think this is interesting. As I told you, about 400 B.C. is when Malachi wrote, obviously families were coming apart. Divorce was running rampant. They were leaving each other over petty things. Mostly the men at that time were abandoning their wives. And the family was coming loose. The fabric of their very being was being destroyed. The same thing's happening today. Okay? This is why I'm so passionate about this. We want politicians to fix our problems. Republican, Democrat, who's going to do this? Who's going to do that? Are they going to give us jobs? Are they going to give us Social Security are they going to give us a good, strong military? Are, are they going to keep us safe? Are they going to provide for our needs? Mm, that ain't going to fix our problem. What's our problem? Satan is attacking the core relationship in America. Marriage. We're missing it. We're blind. We don't understand. Right? The fabric of our being is the most intimate, personal relationship on the planet. That's husband and wife. Everything else comes from it. Adam and Eve were husband and wife before there were countries, before there were cities, before there were nations, before there were governments. They were husband and wife first. God established the marriage unit first. And that's why Satan is picking to destroy it. That's why he's trying to tear it apart. Because our success, our future depends on husbands and wives being the people God wants them to be. So politics? Eh. Let's focus on here. Let's focus on who we are. If we fix this, that won't matter. And what we'll see is an improvement in our own culture and society if we'll do this. So let's get this right. This is where it begins for us. Let's talk about marriage basics, okay? Marriage basics. There's a reason Satan's attacking marriage today. Because it is the fabric. The fabric of our existence as far as human beings go. It's marriage, the most important relationship. Uh, now, if i got to be um, sympathetic or competent, I'm preaching to these couples. I know some of you have had some bad situations in your marriage. Maybe some of you got married outside or got, had children outside of marriage. Maybe some of you had some rough marriages and you're not married anymore, but you're still raising kids and 
Some of you got remarried and you're going through the stepchildren stuff. I mean, yeah, please. Look where you are today. We learn from the past, we live in today, and we look forward to the future. So don't live in the past. Whatever is behind you is behind you. Look at today. If you have children today, this applies to you today. If you have a spouse today, this applies to you today. So start today, okay? Start today. We begin with God's design for marriage, man and woman. A lot of people today are questioning that. They're saying, oh, the Bible doesn't talk about that. The New Testament doesn't specifically. That's garbage. Yes, it's an Old Testament issue. There's no question. But it's also a New Testament issue. In every place we speak of the family, it's male and female, husband and wife. There is, no, uh, there is no other coupling of human beings that God blesses. Okay? So let's just be clear. Not angry, not upset. I'm speaking to those who believe in biblical marriage. And I expect that. The government can do what they want. And we have to honor what the government decides. But in the Lord's house, among the Lord's people, these things work in the Lord's design. Marriage and parenting will only work in a husband and wife, man and woman, Married under godly vows. Okay? So just get the context that I'm speaking of today. Nothing else outside of this works. Alright? Nothing else outside of it works. Husbands, love your wives. Wow! Guys, are we good at this? I mean, I stand before you a weak man. A man who fails a lot in this category. What's the most important thing that we do as men on this planet? It's not our job. It's not our hunting. It's not our fishing. It's not even our parenting. The most important thing we have to do on this planet is to provide the love that our wives need. Period. And it's even classified. Women are just told something else. One line. Men, we have like ten verses to get through our head that we are to love our wives. How? As Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. It's very clear. It's, it's a tall order for men. All right? We must love our wives sacrificially. We must love them the most. We must love them first. We must love them in tangible ways that they know that outside of our relationship with our Heavenly Father, they are the top of our world. They've got to know that. Men, can you look at yourself in a mirror and say that's true of you today? We can't get to parenting until we get through this. It's given in order. What your sons and daughters need to see, men, is you loving your wife first, most and sacrificially. It's the best thing you can do for him. It's the best way you can parent. Okay? Love her as Christ loved the church. Ladies, wives must respect their husbands. Ooh, we don't like this submit word or the respect word. We don't like this because it's been abused. I understand. It's not been that far back in our own nation, in our own culture where men took this verse out of context to make themselves dictators over all that they purvey. And they were dictators. There's no question. All right? They abused this passage. And because of it, our culture has snapped the other way. They say, wait a minute, we don't need male leadership in the home. That's not important. That's God's way. All right? That the man is the head of the family. It goes back to Genesis chapter 3. Okay? All the way back. You'll want to rule over him, but he will rule over you, Eve. And so from the very marriage, the husband was given the right and the obligation to be the head of the family. And it's confirmed in 1 Timothy, the 1 Timothy book, Paul speaks to Timothy and, and, and reiterates that yes, the husband is the head of the family. It's transgenerational. This goes from the beginning of time with Adam and Eve until Christ returns. Guys, you are the head of your family. And you will stand before Jesus Christ one day, and he will not just ask what you did, with your life, but what your wife did with her life and what your children did with their lives. You will answer to Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be the head of your family. It's a huge responsibility, not one to be taken lightly. So ladies, your command is pretty direct and simple. Respect him for it. You notice they don't use love and love. It doesn't say husbands love your wives, wives love your husbands. You notice that, right? We're made differently. There's a reason for that. The Greek words are different. They are love and respect. It's because as men and women, we have different needs. As you understand, the woman needs love, agape love. That's her greatest need on the planet. The man's greatest need is respect. If he was designed and created to be the leader of his family, what's his greatest need? Respect as that leader. All right? Now, both of these are unconditional. 
Men, you got to love your wives even if they're unlovable sometimes. I'm not looking at my wife. I'm looking around her, over her, and through her. And she's looking right at me, isn't she? How does Christ love the church? Unconditionally. Are we lovable? Are we easy to love all the time? Do we do this? Are we good? Are we bad? He loves us at both peaks. And he says that's how we are to love our wife. It's unconditional all the time. It doesn't depend on what she has done. It depends on what I need to do. And wives, you got to respect him even when he doesn't deserve that respect. Do we men ever do things mm, that hurt that? Yeah. we got a lot of stuff up our sleeves. And we're not always easy to respect, but it's your command to do it anyway. These are commands. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. And that is the best thing we can do as parents for our children. That's where parenting begins. It begins with the foundations of marriage. Love and respect. Then, thankfully you get to do this in parallel. We're going to talk about it tonight, by the way. Um, let me tell you, I can't tell you men how to love your wife specifically. I've got to figure out my own wife's language. All the women, you're all crazy. You've got different languages. One of you likes this, and one of you likes that, and one of you likes to go here, and one of you likes to go there, and then you change your mind. We think we've got it figured out. And then for some reason, like, oh, there goes a curveball. Where'd that come from? Um, we're different. Every woman is different, and every woman has a different way she needs to be loved. Okay? And so, guys, it's your job to figure that out. Um, ladies, we men are different. You know, we don't say everything we mean. We don't mean everything we say. Uh, we hold things in. We hide things. I mean, we just, ooh, we're crazy. Um, you got to figure out your specific man and how to best respect him. I don't have time for all that today. We're going to talk about it tonight at 6 o'clock. Come back. I want to hear your, the way you love your, your wife, the way you respect your husbands, because we need to share those things. We need to come together as a small group setting and say, okay, here's what works in my house. Here's what doesn't work in my house. Don't do that. Okay? So we're going to talk about that tonight. But big picture is, what did you do before you got married? You instinctively tried to love and respect each other. I mean, you were courting. It's called courting. You guys, you were trying to figure out how to love this young lady because you wanted to keep her. So you were trying, you were working hard at it. And ladies, you were working hard at saying, I want to keep him. And you were trying to figure out how to do that. So until we got married, we were pretty good at it. And then what happened? Life did. We got married, we got comfortable, we started having kids. We got jobs, we got volunteer stuff. We got crazy and we forgot to court. And then the kids leave and we don't know each other. And the emptiness burns many families. Tonight, we'll talk more about that tonight, okay? We'll get there. Come for specifics. Let's move on. You've got to do the parenting in parallel with the marriage because you will never love your wife enough. You will never respect your husband enough. You're going to do that till you die. So luckily, we can do this in parallel. All right? The first thing we see that Paul boils it down to, parents must insist on obedience and honor. Mm-hmm. we got kids in here, don't we? Kids, he's talking to you. Wake up. Yeah, your phone. Stop playing Facebook or whatever I was playing before church. Um, kids, this is a commandment from God, not from me. Obey your parents. And it's a commandment with promise, as Paul said. If you do this, if you obey your parents, life will go well for you and you will live a long life on this earth. So children must obey their parents. Notice everything is a must on your handout today. They're not options. Children must obey your parents, all right? Parents, who teaches them that? Not the school. Sometimes the church. I don't preach on it every week. You do. Parents must insist on obedience and honor. You must insist on obedience and honor. You must teach it to your children. Why? You are their primary authority until they leave your house and pay their own bills. All right? 18 doesn't have anything to do with it. Until they leave their house and they're independent and they're paying their own way, you are their primary authority. You're their shield. You're their screen. They don't know all the stuff that you do for them. They don't have a clue until they get out of the house and figure it out and go, oh, I want to go home. Um, so you've got to teach them to respect you and obey you. Because if you don't, guess what? They're not going to obey and respect anybody else. If you're the person who invested in their life for 18, 20, 24 years 
and they never learn to respect you and obey you, they're going to be disrespectful, disobedient adults. And we have teachers in here who know that's true. We have uh, policemen in here who know that's true. We have so many people that know that's what's happening in our culture today. Is we've got a disrespectful, disobedient, rebellious generation coming up. Again, look at the stuff on the TV. See what generation is making a mess today. Because they don't respect anybody. They think they're God. And they're just not obedient. And that's the parent's fault. You know, there are some sad places to be, and I can't think, I thought of two as a parent. One is in a courtroom. One is in a courtroom while your child is being charged or sentenced for something that they did wrong. And that parent center shakes their head, I don't get it, I don't understand. Why is my child's life not going well? Why is this happening? And the, the saddest place, though, is at a graveside. At a graveside with an empty hole and a casket with a teenager or a young adult in it shaking their head, I, I don't know why this happened. Remember, this is a, a promise, a command with a promise, and the opposite is true. If you don't instruct them to be obedient and respectful, things won't go well in their life, okay? And they won't have a long life on this earth. You see the intensity behind this command? It's a huge job. We must demand obedience and respect from our kids as long as they're under our roof. We are the primary teachers, okay? Now, that leads right into the next thing. We've got to do that without provoking them. I got a couple of neat responses this morning on this one. All right, we've got to do this without provoking them. We'll talk more on provocation tonight and what it looks like. Some of you have some experience, uh, good and bad, and you could talk about it. I've got to talk from my own experience here. Th these are my failures. How do you provoke your children? One is being overly critical. The negative comes out so easy, doesn't it? It's like there's no filter for the negative. Something bad happens, and there it goes. You know, we just naturally want to tear other people down because it makes us look better. We don't want to admit that, but that's why we do it. It's, it's subconsciously most of the time. We naturally want to tear people down. And so we naturally give the negative. We're naturally critical. Criticism is, it can be positive. But unfortunately, I know for me, a lot of times it's only the negative. And when we only do that, then we're provoking our children. They don't want to respect us and obey us because we're always tearing them down. The other thing that I notice in my life is the unreasonable expectations. Okay? I had a hard time letting my boys cut my yard. Anybody else have trouble with that? I had a hard time. The Lord had to break my neck so they'd have to cut it, and I had to live with it this year. Um... It's just one example. We, we have these expectations somehow, and, some, and they're, they're well motivated. They're positively motivated. We really want them to do well. We want them to do better than we've done. I know that was my dad's prayer. Um, we always want them to be able to go up another level from where we are. And so we set these expectations, and sometimes they're just not achievable. And what do you do when you set somebody up for that? You set them up for failure we hold somebody to an expectation that's out of their reach, that's just not physically possible, we're provoking them because they can never win. Again, those are just two of mine. I hope you're bringing back some of yours. But you've got to think, every time you open your mouth, every time you say something to your child, every time you set an expectation, am I provoking them? Am I being unreasonable? Right? Am I, am I being overly critical? You've got to think these things through. All right? Again, we'll talk more about that. So that's some ways we can provoke our children. So he says, don't provoke your children. Instead, parents must discipline and instruct. Discipline. Ooh, we don't like that word. Okay? This is one of the ways, just like with marriage. Some have failed. Some men have failed, become dictators, and made awful messes of their marriage. And so our culture today says, no, it doesn't have to be driven by the husband. We can share the obligation, or, or the right person should be in charge. So we got away from that. We snapped completely away in our culture because a few have failed. Same things happen in discipline. This has been abused by some. Some children have been hurt, right? Some children have been abused in discipline, and as a result, our culture has gone to the other side. Never discipline your children. It's mean to discipline your children. You see what's happened. A few people have done it wrong, and we've gotten away from the truth because of it. We've got to get back to it. We've got to get back to the biblical definition of discipline. Discipline in the Bible, the Greek word is paideia, and paideia means to correct with punishment. Right? In English, it's actually a bigger word than just discipline. It's to correct 
with punishment. So let's talk about the punishment part of it. This is, again, something we'll talk about more tonight. Punishment in Scripture has a clear connotation of physical punishment. There has to be a physical element to the punishment. Why? Because we're teaching our children that suffering comes from disobedience. Because that's God's economy. I just explained to you what happened to Israel and what happened to Judah. In God's economy, suffering comes because we're disobedient. What we hope is we can cause lower suffering earlier so they don't get there. And so we're trying to teach them with physical obedience that pain does come with bad decisions. But it needs to be appropriate for the age, for the child. Again, we'll talk more about that tonight. But there is a physical aspect of discipline. And that's the punitive side. Something else has to come with it. If you just punish your children and you never do this, then you are abusing them. Listen close. If you're just on this part, if you're just on the physical discipline and you never do the next part, it's abuse. The other part is the correction part. Yes, we must physically correct our children, but then we must speak to them. What do we tell them? What did they do that was wrong? They've got to know what, what was wrong. Why was it wrong? And we need to use God's Word to explain why it's wrong. What does right look like? That's discipline. It has a physical punishment with an explanation of what was wrong, what's right, how do I do it? That's proper biblical discipline. And folks, who's responsible? Dad. Dads. Too many dads are failing. Ask your school teachers. Okay? Because undisciplined children turn into undisciplined adults and teenagers. Right? It's awful. Comes back here. He says, fathers, don't provoke them. Fathers, discipline them. And fathers, instruct them. Okay? I hope your kids are here with you today. You know, I told first service, I've said it before, I had a drug problem when I was a kid. Mom and dad drove me to church. Every time the doors were open, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, it didn't matter revivals, it didn't matter weekend services. If the doors were open, we were there, and I had to go. Wasn't a choice. He drove me in football pads before. All right? Baseball uniforms, I'd been dragged to church from practice. I was drugged to church. Why? Because my dad was committed to this. He was committed to making sure I was brought up in the instruction that comes from the Lord. He wasn't a theologian. He wasn't a scholar. He was my example to watch living the Word of God, and that's how he instructed me. But he took me to the church, which is the equipping station of the saints, where we have pastors and youth pastors, associate pastors and teachers. we got people who God has called and equipped to open the Scriptures and teach the Scriptures. Your kids have to be here with you. Don't drop and run. That's not good parenting. It's not okay. Because you've got to grow too. Because as they get older, as they get smarter, you can't let them outsmart you. Especially when it comes to the Bible. They'll turn it on you and abuse you with it. They will. I've had it done. Okay? I've had it done. That's not what it really says. Oh, great conversation. But that's our jobs. Dad's responsible, but it's a parenting job to make sure the kids are raised up in the instruction of the Lord. Also in the secular instruction. School is important to our kids. they got to learn math and science and history and social studies and all that stuff. And who's responsible for it? Their teachers? No! Some of us blow this. We are. It's great that they've been called to do what they do and they do a thankless job for too little money. And they invest in our kids all that they have. But that's just eight hours a day, five days a week. we got them the rest of the time and it's our responsibility to make sure that they're learning in school. Because why? Because we want to put missionaries in the world. We don't want them just to know Jesus. We want them to know Jesus as a plumber. We want to know Jesus as a carpenter. We want them to know Jesus as they're working in an office or the assembly line. We're supposed to be witnesses. Right? And so they need the secular education along with the spiritual so they can be productive in this world. And they see that? Whose job is it? Mine. Yours. Wow. This tough stuff, isn't it? Think about what I read to you from Malachi. The nation was coming apart at the seams, and the seams were marriage. And that's why God was so upset. He goes on in the next passage to say, that's why I hate divorce. Because you were supposed to be one flesh, and you were supposed to produce godly children. He doesn't hate divorce because he's an angry God. He hates divorce because it undoes what he designed. So I encourage you, you families that are here today that dedicated your children, understand what God wants of you. He wants you to be husbands and wives first. Love and respect first. Then he wants you to raise up these children to be obedient, disciplined, intelligent children. 
who can take godliness to the next generation. And that's how God reproduces through us. And so I encourage you today, if you don't know where to start, if this is kind of shocking, if this is kind of hard, I'll take you where I go. I've got certain memory verses for certain things, and I hope you have them as well. Uh, certain situations happen, and I'll throw Scripture at it. You know, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but power, love, and sound mind. Boom, 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 and I'm afraid of something. Here's a big one. Jesus said this, and this is, should be a memory verse for you. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. You want to be a good dad? You need to be a good dad? Seek the kingdom of God first. You want to be a good mom, a good wife? Seek the kingdom of God first. You want to be a good, obedient child? You want to be honoring your parents? Seek the kingdom of God first. It all starts with the primary relationship and that's the one we have with God through Jesus Christ. And so I just encourage you as, as believers here today, uh, we saw a good response this morning in the early service. I hope we see it again. Um, we need to look in the mirror of God's word and see ourselves. Men, am I loving my wife? Am I fulfilling my greatest commandment on this earth? Okay, starts there. Ladies, am I respecting my husband? I mean, is, am I fulfilling my greatest command? And then as parents, specifically dad, you know, are you provoking your children? Can they respect you? Will they obey you? Um, are they getting the instruction that they need and the discipline that they require? This is the day to turn that around. That's why God brought you here. And if not, maybe you can encourage somebody else in your own areas of life, those of you who are visiting with us, about God's plan for the family. This is what he wants. and We need to honor him. So as a parent or, or child, you can come and pray this morning if you need to. If you're already a believer, just let us know if you'd like to pray. For those of you who don't know Jesus Christ, you're not a Christian, um, and you're still trying to figure this out, um, marriage is supposed to be a picture of Christ's love for the church. When you look at a man who's loving his wife unconditionally, you are seeing the way that you are loved through Jesus Christ. And he showed that love by coming to earth, taking on flesh, dying on the cross, and shedding his blood for our sins so that we could be forgiven, and then being resurrected on the third day so that we could know this eternal life. So I challenge you this morning... Scripture says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And that's what saved means, to be forgiven and have the hope of eternal life and to be equipped to be the husband, the father, the parent that God's called you to be. This will be the time to come. God, thank you for what you've done, who you are, what you mean to us. You've challenged us this morning as people, parents, fathers, husbands, children. Everybody in this room fits one of those roles. And so thank you for the responsibility you've given us. Thank you for the reminders of your word. And for those who may have heard it for the very first time, I just pray that they will understand you are a merciful God. And yes, you ask of these things, but you will equip us to perform them. And so for those of us who already know you, thanks for the spirit that resides within us to remind us of truth. Those who don't know you, thanks for the opportunity to share with them how to be the person that they really can be through Jesus Christ. A very rewarding and satisfying rich and satisfying life, Jesus says. May this be the day that they'll let their guard down enough to open their hearts to receiving Christ. Give them the strength to come forward and just say, I want to be saved today. God, we love you and we thank you. Bless your invitation in Jesus' holy name. Amen. This is your time to respond.